Good afternoon. I'm here for today's Government of Alberta update on our uh, fight against COVID-19 together with uh, Chief Medical Officer for Health, Dr. Dina Henshaw and Minister for Municipal Affairs, Casey Madu, who's also responsible for the Alberta Emergency Management Agency and who I'm glad to see is now out of self-isolation. Uh, now, as we know, uh, we have some positive news to share about hundreds of uh, private companies I'll be mentioning in a moment and nonprofit groups that are stepping up to help in the fight against COVID-19. First though, I want to update Albertans on the progress uh, we're making on the pandemic. As of this afternoon, the global number of reported infections is approaching 1.1 million and the number of deaths attributed to the virus is 58,000. Canadian totals are 11,746 infections and 153 deaths. Here in Alberta, testing has confirmed 107 new cases over the last 24 hours, bringing the total to 1,075, and it is my sad duty to report to five additional deaths of Albertans from the virus, bringing the total of those lost to 18. And we offer our condolences uh, to all of the loved ones of those whose lives have been lost in the past week. Today's increase in infections is a big number, but it uh, derives from one of our largest single day total of test results, uh, over 4,000 completed tests. That number lifts our total number of tests completed to over 60,000. That's about 13,600 per million, which is significantly higher than any other province indeed about three times the rate in Ontario and the vast majority of countries around the world. To offer a bit more context for these numbers, uh, the rate of total identified inf infections in Alberta currently stands at about 243 uh, uh, per million. That is higher than the global rate, currently estimated at 138 uh, per million, but many uh, countries around the world are not testing at significant levels. It is also much lower than the rate in the most severely affected countries like Spain, Italy, and the United States, which respectively stand at 2,500, uh, 2,000, and 800 cases per million. This data indicates that Alberta's health system is handling uh, the pandemic better than most. The rate of COVID caused deaths per million in Alberta at just over four is uh, almost half the global rate of 7.5 and far below the rate in the most severely affected countries. I caution that this is just a snapshot in time, but it does reflect where Alberta is today uh, and has consistently been for th the past three weeks relative to the rest of the world. The total number of infections and deaths will undoubtedly continue to rise uh, in the days and in the weeks to come but so will the number of recovered cases, which today stands at 196 here in Alberta. If we can continue to keep the rates of infection and of death in the context of active cases at these relatively low levels, we will know that the countermeasures we have taken are working and will get through the pandemic with proportionally much lower human costs than in other parts of the world. We are reaching the point where we have enough data to inform credible uh, modeling about potential paths of the pandemic in Alberta. And we intend to deliver uh, those details of our models early next week. I can assure Albertans today, however, that the modeling indicates that we have the healthcare equipment, personnel, and supplies needed to cope with anticipated hospitalizations, including in intensive care units and including, including the usage of ventilators. Our relative success so far is a testament to the effectiveness of our pandemic response plan and countermeasures, the skill and effort of Alberta's frontline healthcare workers, and the cooperation of the vast majority of Albertans in doing their part to contain the spread of the virus. So let me say thank you to everybody who has carefully followed uh, the uh, health care rules, the uh, protocol and advice, the hygiene rules, the public health orders. Thank you for those who are trying to stay at home uh, whenever they can and to uh, respect the rules around social distancing. It is impressive but not surprising how many are stepping up to join the fight. Sitting at home and doing nothing come, does not come easy to Albertans. 
We have Canada's youngest population and a lot of energy and a fierce devotion to community and to family, a powerful urge to do something, to do anything, to help our family, friends, and neighbors get through this tough, tough time. The best measure of this compassionate, can-do spirit of Albertans is in the amazing number of offers and donations that the Emergency Management Agency has received uh, through what we've called the Unsolicited Offers Program. And today, we are launching an expanded version of this we are launching the Bits and Pieces program. During the Second World War, the Canadian Minister for Munitions and Supplies, C.D. Howe, launched what he called the Bits and Pieces program, which was a call to the entire Canadian economy to do what it could through innovation uh, and production to support the war effort. That is the kind of spirit I'm calling on Albertans to exhibit today. If you are a manufacturer, uh, if you uh, produce goods that could be in any way useful to this fight against the pandemic, we ask you to come forward, uh, offer your help, uh, and uh, show us uh, the kind of uh, Alberta spirit in innovation, in production, that we can generate to help fight the pandemic. The program has only been up and running uh, in a preliminary phase for a week, and already we've received more than a thousand uh, offers from companies, uh, from nonprofits and charities, and individuals. Let me cite just a few examples. Atco, the great uh, global company founded and based here in Alberta that got its start providing uh, trailers for the Defense Department and the oil patch, is now a diversified, diversified global corporation best known to most Albertans, perhaps as a provider of gas and electricity, and they have offered to contribute up to several hundred trailers if necessary. These could be used for COVID testing, treatment, and quarantining, especially in rural and remote areas without adequate medical facilities. Another very helpful homegrown offer that quickly blossomed into a huge national effort came from the little uh, Diony Craft Whiskey Distillery in uh, Red Deer County. They introduced the idea of making hand sanitizer to offer Alberta craft brewers and distillers, and it took off, excuse me, to other distillers and brewers, and it took off nationally. So what began as a 150 liter donation of sanitizer from Diani has grown into uh, similar contributions from several Alberta breweries and uh, distilleries, and a national offer of 12,000 liters of sanitizer from Labatt Breweries of Canada, PCL Construction, came through with a donation of 800 protective masks for healthcare workers earlier this week. And just today comes the amazing news that IKEA Edmonton is donating nearly 42,000 N95 respirator masks to frontline Alberta Health Services staff. I can't describe all of the 1,100 offers that we have received uh, through the Emergency Management Agency, but I'll just give you a couple more. Uh, the Ross Haven Bible Camp has offered their supply of more than 495 uh, masks uh, that uh, they had for their woodworking shop, plus 250 liters of hand sanitizer. Alberta's hotel operators, who are hard hit by this economic crisis, have so far offered about 3,000 rooms for healthcare workers, first responders, or Albertans needing emergency isolation. Alberta Garment, a Calgary-based uh, apparel manufacturer, has switched into producing protective gowns for healthcare workers, and we thank them. The Rebel Heart Water Hauling Company, love that name, uh, in, in Edmonton is making its fleet of 17 trucks available to haul fresh water for first responders if and when needed. This kind of generosity and of caring is, occur is happening all across Canada. To cite but one example, this week, Alberta-based uh, energy and oil sands giant Suncor donated 40,000 N95 masks for distribution across the three northern territories. Lastly, I want to mention a, a couple more stories about local acts of exceptional kindness and compassion that have surfaced in the last few days. Uh, one is in Calgary, where the owner of the Western RV company, Bruce Urban, heard a plea from a front, frontline health worker for an RV uh, where, where, uh, should, uh, where people could stay instead of uh, at home. In other words, uh, people who are healthcare workers needed a place to stay rather than being at home and, and potentially infecting their family. 
Even though his business is shuttered, Bruce and his employees stepped up to help that health worker and at, at least a half dozen more of the Al Albertans Bruce call the heroes of our society. Another great story is about uh, Calgary members of the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees team up, teaming up with Costume Alchemy to, to assemble a team of home-based sewers to make protective grounds, uh, gowns for workers at the Calgary Drop-In Centre. They need plenty of fabric, so if you have any fabric to donate, I'm sure they'd love to hear from you. The mobilization of our province to fight COVID extends beyond these contributions by businesses and civil society groups to include Albertans in many other walks of life. Among them are some of our best scientific minds, now focused on developing new ways to protect us from the virus, including as part of the national and international race to develop treatments and vaccines. A good example is University of Alberta biomedical engineer Hugh Jek Choi, who is developing a surgical mask coated with a substance that kills the virus. Minister Madhu will offer more details about how every Albertan can help, but I, once again, I want to repeat a call out to all Albertans to do what you can. If you have material that you think would be helpful, uh, to frontline health care workers, to uh, staff in our homeless shelters, to uh, people who are in self-isolation. Uh, please uh, notify the Alberta Emergency Management Agency Bits and Pieces program. We'll be putting up a specific website later today and Minister Madhu will be offering uh, a designated email address. Thank you to the thousands of Albertans who have already offered help and keep it coming because we're all in this together. Winning the battle against COVID will involve all of us. Government obviously has a big role to play, but at the end of the day, victory will depend on the strength of our entire society, on families, on charities, on businesses, on civil society groups. And with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Minister Madhu. Thank you, uh, Premier Kenny, and good afternoon, everyone. As the Premier said, in recent days, we have seen a tremendous outpouring of support from Alberta's private and non-profit sectors. In fact, in just one week, uh, through the Alberta Bits and Pieces program, we have received more than 1,100 offers of support from businesses, and organizations, big and small. We have received offers from major multinational companies. We've received offers from small local businesses, of whom some are transitioning to author the product or services they are capable of delivering. And we have received offers from churches and non-profits. I want to tell you about one example that touched my heart from the Archived Society of Alberta, who is offering two N95 masks. They said in their submission, quote, it's not much, but it's what we have, unquote. This spirit of compassion and kindness has gotten our province through tough times in the past, and it would get us through tough times now. If any individual or organization has a product or service they would like to offer, we encourage them to visit albera.ca slash COVID-19, and you will find a link to the Bates and Pieces program to do so. We look at every submission, and we respond to the ones that have the potential to meet a need. I look forward to continuing to watch these generous offers pour in for the good of our province and our people. Uh, this will help us meet the demand for critical product and services and to keep our Albertans safe. And like the Premier, I would want to uh, offer our condolences to those Alberta families who have, loved, uh, who have lost loved ones. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, with that, We'll be happy to take your questions. No, well, Dr. Sorry, Hinshaw I'm, first. My apologies, Dr. Hinshaw, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Premier. Um, and thank you for coming this afternoon. 
Uh, I want first to clarify information that I provided yesterday regarding a positive case of COVID-19 reported at the YWCA Calgary's Sheriff King home. This case was confirmed on Saturday, March 21st, and since then there have been no more individuals with symptoms at this location. For our numbers today, as the Premier mentioned, since yesterday we have confirmed 107 new cases of COVID-19 in Alberta. This brings the total number of cases to 1,075. Of these, 196 people have now recovered, which is 22 more than yesterday. We suspect 137 of our total cases may be community transmission, an increase of 29 from yesterday. Sadly, as you heard the Premier mention, I must report five additional deaths related to COVID-19, including four at the Mackenzie Town Continuing Care Centre in Calgary. There are now eight deaths related to COVID-19 at this facility. Today's reported deaths also include a woman in her 20s from Edmonton. It is not clear at this time whether she had underlying health conditions. This is a tragic reminder that it is not only the elderly or those with underlying conditions who are at risk. The measures we have in place are to protect all of us. I want to say that I have heard questions about whether we should let, try to let spread happen in young and healthy groups to increase our population's immunity over time. I completely understand this question, but the problem is that we don't know who will have a severe case of this disease. Some people who are young and healthy will go on to have severe disease and even die. So until we have more information about who may be at the greatest risk and more evidence about treatments, the best way to prevent severe illness is for all of us to perform physical distancing, to stay home when possible, to avoid non-essential activities, to limit further deaths, we must all follow public health orders. There are many grieving families in our province today, and I extend my sincere condolences to each and every one of them and all the loved ones of those we have lost. We can honour these people by recommitting to physical distancing and staying home whenever possible. It is particularly important as the spring approaches that we make different decisions about our vacations. Please do not plan to travel to vacation homes, especially those in other provinces and in smaller communities. We need to be staying close to home over the coming months to limit the spread of this virus. I want to talk now about what we are learning from our data. Last week, I announced that we were shifting our testing approach to better understand and identify the spread of this virus in our province. We stopped testing returning travelers with mild symptoms earlier this week and instead prioritized at-risk populations and those at highest risk of local exposure, such as healthcare workers. This was a necessary step. We need to use resources effectively to protect people at risk and quickly identify spread in the community. Looking at the graph of confirmed cases that you will see posted on our website, it may appear we are seeing a spike in the number of people infected in the last few days. What we are actually seeing is the excellent work of lab services to work through a backlog of swabs that were waiting to be tested. To be clear, we continue to see ongoing new infections, but the sudden increase we have seen recently represents the date the lab completed the test, not when a person became ill. One of the most important numbers we have been tracking all along is the number of new cases we are seeing who don't have a link to another known case. We have called these community acquired. Although we have announced additional cases in that group over the past few days, what I can tell you is that when we look at the number of these cases by the day the swab was collected, instead of the day the lab tested the swab, we are seeing that our new daily numbers of community acquired cases have remained relatively constant over the last 10 days. Every one of these cases is concerning and we follow up with every case to ensure that we are limiting spread. However, it does not seem at this moment that we are seeing a rapid rise in local transmission. We will continue to closely monitor these numbers. 
our collective work to flatten the curve is more imperative than ever. The world learns more every day about COVID-19. Someone asked me yesterday when this will end. We cannot say for certain, but we should expect that we will be responding to this infection for many months. I know this is difficult to hear. Thank you for doing your best to adjust to the new normal and as Premier and Minister have mentioned, to make sure that your time, energy and abilities are con contributing to the collective effort to respond. I encourage you to continue to reach out to each other for support, especially through virtual means. Also, please continue to place your trust in healthcare professionals. Doctors, nurses and all medical staff are doing a tremendous job in a very difficult time. I have recently heard disturbing reports of healthcare professionals experiencing discrimination due to the fear that they will be more likely to carry the virus. This discrimination even includes threats of eviction from their homes. I assure you these trained professionals are going above and beyond to stop the spread of the virus, both at their workplaces and in their homes. The practices many of us are still adjusting to including proper hand washing and other preventive measures, have always been part of healthcare professionals' daily lives. Instead of being afraid, we should continue to work together and be prepared to prevent the spread, stay informed and flatten the curve. One additional preventive measure that Alberta Health Services is putting in place today is limiting vis visitors to hospitals. With few exceptions, patients in hospital will no longer be able to have any visitors in person. Please plan to support loved ones in hospital with virtual visits instead. We are continuing to watch the situation in our province very closely. We need to move forward together, even though we are physically distanced, to ensure we take care of each other during this time. Thank you, and we'll now be happy to take questions. Okay, great. We'll start at the phones. Operator, can you put through the first caller, please? Yes, first question is from Chris Barco of the Health Bureau. Please go ahead. Hi, this is a question for the Premier. Premier, there's a, a meeting going to be held next week by OPEC and some other countries talking about a potential uh, oil production sharing agreement. I'm just wondering whether you or any Alberta officials have been invited to take part or whether you'd consider taking part, and I guess maybe more importantly, would Alberta be willing to join any kind of global oil curtailment deal with OPEC countries? We have been invited to participate and Energy Minister Sonia Savage will be participating in the uh, Monday conference call with OPEC Plus. Uh, she'll be participating uh, uh, to have it with, with an open mind uh, about uh, what actions uh, may be necessary. Uh, but as I've said, uh, it, it's OPEC and Russia that started this fire and they've got to put it out. Uh, they uh, irresponsibly decided to maintain and even surge supply in the midst of a total uh, uh, cratering of demand. And that is why we've ended up with, with the, the lowest energy prices in, in real terms uh, in, in, since the Second World War. And uh, which is, it poses a, a devastating challenge. Uh, to millions of families across North America whose livelihoods are connected to the energy sector. So um, Minister Savage uh, will be participating in the OPEC Plus conference call uh, and uh, over the course of this week I have spoken to uh, uh, several uh, key uh, players in, uh, in the American administration, in the United States Congress, U.S. governors uh, and uh, key decision makers in the industry about uh, how to protect uh, North American jobs from the predatory dumping of energy uh, by the Saudis and Russians. Um, I've continued conversations about ideas such as a, a continental uh, import tariff on foreign oil imports uh, and other measures. Uh, I was just spoke, speaking to a uh, UN editor today uh, who is trying to get a, uh, uh, a, an investigation launched by the United States about uh, the dumping of, of, uh, of Saudi oil into uh, the market. So 
Um, we will keep an open mind. Let me remind uh, you, Chris, that uh, Alberta imposed curtailment on our production back in uh, January of last year. So we've already been in curtailment. Uh, we cannot have a meaningful impact on global prices because of our landlocked status. Um, but uh, we are open to playing a role if there's a larger effort uh, to, to stop, uh, to frankly stop the madness. Great, we'll go to the floor. Go ahead. Yeah, I believe this is a question for Dr. Hinshaw. Um, we've been hearing a lot about senior facilities over the past week. I was just wondering if and when potentially there's cases uh, verified in places such as jails or some of the larger centers that have been turned into those without a permanent address. Will we be getting the same sort of information on those cases and has there been any cases at this time in any of those facilities? So. Uh, there have been no cases, no confirmed cases that have been reported to me in any correctional facilities or homeless shelters. Uh, so the, the work that we've been doing with facilities to prepare, so for example with homeless shelters, making sure that there's spacing of at least one meter between mats, making sure that there's screening for those who are going into those shelters if they do have symptoms, that they're kept separate from others, that testing is available to them. Those are all measures that we're taking to prevent that spread if there should be a case in that uh, context then we would be definitely putting in additional measures to prevent any further spread. Uh, and it's our goal to be transparent. Uh, what we have to balance is that transparency, the public's right to know, uh, also making sure that when we disclose information, we're not causing excess anxiety and fear uh, at the local level. So uh, absolutely we'll be disclosing the information that, that we have, um, but also making sure that we're working very closely with local organizations uh, so that we're not causing additional strain and worry on their practices. All right, we'll go back to the phones. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Yes, the next question is from Emma Graney of the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Yeah, g'day. I'm going to throw this one to Dr. Hinshaw. You mentioned uh, that you're announcing that nobody will be allowed to have an in-person hospital visit. Can you give us a little bit more information here about why that decision was made and also how it might apply to, for example, women who are currently about to give birth and may want a support there with them? Sure, so uh, there will be some exceptions. So for example, children who are admitted to hospital, uh, typically having a parent nearby is, or, or a guardian um, is something that is extremely helpful. And so there will be some exceptions on a case-by-case -case basis for some of those situations. Uh, and certainly more details about, for example, women who are giving birth and their ability to have someone with them. Uh, I think we can work with Alberta Health Services to get details on uh, the exact exceptions, yeah, seeing nods. Um, so we'll make sure that, that that's clear. With respect to why this was put in place, uh, as we see additional cases and we, we know that there is community transmission happening, especially in our large centres, it becomes ever more important that we are minimizing the chance that someone may unwittingly bring in a virus to a hospital. So there have been measures that have already been put in place such as restricting children from visiting and making sure that uh, visitors have a, a screening check when they come in the, the door of a hospital. But really the fewer people who come into any given place, the, the more the chances are reduced that of the virus could be brought in. And so again, at this time, this is a measure that Alberta Health Services is taking. And I believe it's the correct thing to do to make sure that we're limiting as much as possible risk of spread in a hospital where we have people who are already very sick. Go back to the floor. Go ahead, Julia. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. Today the CDC announced that all Americans should wear cloth masks. What's your direction to Albertans and what type of masks would you recommend they do wear? So this is a topic that uh, we've been looking into for some time. I did ask our scientific advisory group to look at the most recent evidence around masks in the general public. Uh, what I would say is that we know that masks can limit the spread of infection from a person who is infected to others. We also know, as I've said before, that a small proportion of people who have COVID uh, may spread the virus before they have symptoms. And so it is certainly something that, uh, again, in general, wearing a mask would be more protective for those who are wearing it um, 
it would be it would protect others from those who are wearing the mask rather than protecting the person wearing it uh, from others. So, so in that vein, I certainly think that masks can be considered. The challenge with cloth masks, and I haven't seen the, the CDC summary of evidence, I've just seen our provincial summary of evidence. The challenge with cloth masks is understanding whether those cloth masks do as good a job as surgical masks in preventing the spread of infection. And so we know from some studies that when cloth masks get damp, so if someone wears them for a long period of time, they actually can start to trap virus and they could be a risk for the person wearing them. And so that's why I've asked our team to look very deeply at all available evidence because what I wouldn't want to have happen is for people to start wearing cloth masks and inadvertently therefore expose themselves to more risk when what we want to do is lower the risk more broadly. So what I would say to people who are wanting to wear masks is first of all, all of our surgical masks and medical masks um, we need to make sure that our healthcare workers and those who are at the front lines have access to enough supplies to protect them in those highest risk settings. So that uh, supply issue is one thing to consider. Second of all, if people are considering wearing cloth masks, they need to make sure that they are washing their hands very well before they put the mask on. And if they're taking the mask off, they need to wash their hands before they take the mask off. and after they put the mask in a place where it can be washed and make sure that uh, that mask is not in a place where others can touch it and that they're not wearing a mask for prolonged periods of time, a cloth mask, when it can get damp and then possibly expose them to more risk. So I hope to have more to say on this next week because again, I have asked our scientific team to look at the evidence, uh, but that is what the current state of, of evidence that's been reported to me is, that there could be some risks with cloth masks. Um, but again, we are weighing out that evidence and hope to have a formal recommendation by next week. Okay, back to the phones. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Thank you. The next call is from Kevin Nimick of CTV. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. Can you please clarify the rules for driving in a vehicle? Uh, yesterday you said non-symptomatic people who are not under mandatory self-isolation would not be fined for traveling with family or carpooling with coworkers. Would you face a penalty if you were found in a vehicle with someone who is not a coworker? And is there a limit for how many people can be in a vehicle at the same time? So the uh, legal orders that are in place right now um, do not specify how many people can be in a vehicle or that uh, people have to be co-workers or related. So uh, I have uh, sent a memo through our colleagues at Justice to the policing services to clarify the intention of my order. And my order in terms of the legal requirements for people uh, to be staying home are if somebody has returned from international travel, they must stay home for two weeks. If someone uh, has been in close contact with a confirmed case, they must stay home for two weeks. And if someone has any symptoms, so be that sore throat, runny nose, fever, cough, shortness of breath, they must stay home uh, for a minimum of 10 days from the start of those symptoms or until their symptoms resolve, whichever of those two is longer. So those are the, the legal requirements. With respect to two meter distancing, that is a recommendation that is not legally enforceable with respect to private individuals in a private vehicle. And so again, my recommendation would be that people should uh, be limiting the number of others with whom they're in contact. Uh, and so within a vehicle, it's difficult to maintain that two meter separation. And so my recommendation would be, again, that, that people consider uh, the distancing between themselves and others and not be in close contact with others. But again, the, the restrictions for being in a vehicle are not legally enforceable. Uh, and these are recommendations at this time, unless they meet those three um, criteria that I outlined. Okay. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Thank you, Yes. The next question is from Jennifer Lee of CBC. Please go ahead. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. My question is about um, potential drug shortages in the hospital setting. Um, you know, we are hearing concerns about that elsewhere, uh, a shortage of drugs needed in the hospital to fight COVID. Um, I guess what's your feeling about what the situation looks like here in Alberta from that perspective and what might be being done uh, to ensure that, that we don't experience this bridge down the line. So with respect to drug shortages, um, there are a couple of 
of areas, I guess. So one is we know that with the measures in place around the world to limit the spread of COVID, that there are some concerns that have been raised with respect to supply chains of medications that we normally get from places like India or China. Uh, and I know that our uh, pharmaceutical group is working very closely with colleagues across the country and uh, within the province to make sure that wherever there are concerns with regular uh, scheduled shipments of medication that we flag that early and, and look for opportunities to uh, supplement. I'm not aware of any specific medication shortages at this time. Again, this is a proactive measure that's being taken. With respect to other medications that I spoke about earlier this week, there are some medications, uh, for example, some anti-malarial medications that are also used for treatment of illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis. And those medications are currently being tested for possible use in COVID patients. And I know that uh, there are some clinical trials that are being developed and that clinical trials being research that COVID patients in Alberta will have an opportunity to participate in. Uh, so those are just being set up right now and the supply of medication for those trials uh, has been assured through work with manufacturers and that supply should not impact availability of medications for others who need that. Uh, but that is why I uh, issued my request to physicians and pharmacists uh, to not be prescribing these kinds of medications outside of these clinical trials is because when they are being prescribed widely, that's where we could get into a situation of shortages. Okay, back to the floor. Janet, go ahead. Uh, this is a question for the Premier. We just... Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. We just had noticed that the Assembly will be resuming next week. Can you tell us what legislation is coming up? There will be uh, more legislation, more amendments to the Emergency Management Act that municipalities have requested uh, to uh, clarify certain authorities. Uh, we'll also be uh, allowing for municipal bylaw officers to enforce public health orders. Uh, there will uh, likely be further uh, legislation on um, economic initiatives. Uh, this is a work in progress, um, and so I'm, I uh, please stay tuned for a full briefing from the government house leader. Uh, that will be on Monday, I believe. And I'm, I'm sorry I don't have uh, more details. We we do have worked out a an understanding with the uh, opposition in the Alberta legislature to sit on a limited basis uh, for uh, primarily for COVID related matters, uh, both on the public health and the economic uh, fronts. Uh, but uh, this also allows an opportunity for uh, the government to be held to account uh, in the in the legislature. Um, and uh, so I, I think we've got the right balance. We're maintaining uh, fewer than, than 50 people with uh, distancing between the members during the sittings. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll, we'll continue to sit periodically on a limited basis, uh, particularly to allow us urgently to pass important legislation that's related to COVID. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Thank you, yes. The next question is from Claire Theobald of Star Edmonton. Please go ahead. Hi there. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Jason Kenney, uh, there has been a rumbling, obviously, uh, 3M released a statement uh, saying that the uh, U.S. government has asked them to uh, stop sending uh, uh, masks or medical equipment uh, out of the country as they deal with the COVID uh, response as it uh, is happening there. Uh, I know there are some orders out for medical supplies here. Uh, is there any concern uh, that this could cause uh, any kind of disruption for the supplies Albertans are currently waiting for. Well, we are we do have orders for masks uh, that are not from the United States. We are uh, doing everything we can to get additional supplies, including uh, N95 masks uh, and other uh, personal protection equipment for our healthcare workers and other frontline workers, and we're very intentionally trying to source from many different countries because of the interruption or risk or threats posed to the supply lines. And so, and uh, the, dis the announcement today by President Trump is extremely disappointing. Uh, 
it reminds me of what happened in 1939 and 1940 when Canada was part of the fight against global fascism. The United States sat out the first two or three years and actually initially refused to even provide supplies uh, to Canada and the United Kingdom that was leading the fight at the time. Uh, I, uh, if I had a chance to speak to President Trump, I would remind him about Canada's solidarity following 9-11 and in the global fight against terror terrorism. Uh, we have made very real sacrifices to stand by our American friends and allies. And as a Canadian, I am insulted uh, by the decision announced today uh, to block the export of critically not needed uh, medical equipment uh, that we need to fight the pandemic here in this country. Uh, and I think it's short-sighted because uh, the United States ultimately is a net importer of this kind of equipment. But it also underscores why we must produce our own uh, critical equipment here at home because apparently we can't even count on our closest friend and ally uh, to be a supplier. That's why one of the reasons why we've launched the Bits and Pieces program today Again, calling on, on our uh, experience in history uh, during the Second World War when uh, the entire Canadian economy became geared up to support the effort. Uh, suppliers, small and large, uh, all played some role in that. That's why it was called the Bits and Pieces Program. I want to commend my uh, colleague, uh, Premier Doug Ford of Ontario, uh, for uh, trying to harness the, the enormous uh, capacity of the uh, Ontario manufacturing sector uh, to help produce, uh, for example, ventilators uh, and N95 masks. Uh, we are pursuing uh, our own domestic efforts here in Alberta. Uh, and uh, I commit that to, to, the, to the extent that we can, uh, we will be prepared to share some of that equipment across Canada. Obviously, we must take care of our own health care needs first and ensure that we have surplus equipment and redundant uh, supplies. Uh, but um, uh, we will not uh, uh, respond in the same way that the President of the United States has today. That's very dis disappointing. Uh, and again, I would, I would remind our American uh, friends and neighbors that we've always been there together uh, in, in uh, important moments in history, and we should be there together at this important moment in history. We'll come back to the floor. Go ahead, Lisa. I have a question for Dr. Hinshaw. Um, just to go back to uh, what you mentioned about community spread, um, can you speak a little bit more about what that means um, about our efforts to flatten the curve? And I'm, I'm also wondering about yesterday, um, you had mentioned the 2% rate of confirmed cases among tests. Does that rate mm -hmm. continue? So uh, with respect to confirmed, sort of the community acquired cases, those where we don't have a source, uh, certainly those are concerning because what they tell us is that there are cases that uh, we don't know about that have then spread to somebody else. And so with respect to our um, analysis of that, again, one of the things that we're looking at is the, the total number that we've seen. Some of those cases are those that come in and are hospitalized that have severe illness, and others are cases who maybe happen to work in healthcare uh, or another setting where they potentially have other exposures beyond just working in healthcare. And I think what we what we need to look at is are those is the number of those cases growing steadily over time or rapidly? And at the present moment, again, the number of those cases has been relatively constant over time. Again, our our testing protocol change has really only been um, in effect for the last several days because we did need to move through that backlog of tests that had of swabs that had previously been done on returning travelers. Uh, so. It's early days yet. We continue to watch very closely, but again, um, what we're seeing right now is that, that the number of those cases does not seem to be changing significantly over time, but, but we are watching. With respect to the percentage overall, uh, it remains at approximately 2%. That hasn't changed significantly. We are seeing higher uh, percentage of positivity um, in the Calgary area with respect to the percent of all tests that are testing positive in, in the Calgary zone. Um, and the rest of the province is uh, is under, under that Calgary percentage, but overall it's still about 2%, um, and that hasn't changed dramatically in the last week or so. Okay, Operator, can you please put through the next caller? Yes, the next caller is, for, is Kenny Trenton from Kix FM. Please go ahead. 
Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Henshaw. Um, it's always good news when you could see a, bunch, a lot of recovered cases. Um, is there anything that uh, you may have learned from those recovered cases? Were they most of them like natural organic recoveries? Were some medications tried? Is there anything based on these near 200 um, recoveries that you can maybe share and say that, oh, this may be working or this may not be working? So it's a little too early to tell. Uh, the majority of those recovered cases are those who were at home, who had a mild illness, and recovered on their own. Uh, I think the questions about what we can learn about what medications might be helpful or what things might help people recover is exactly why there are studies that are being put in place so that we can learn in a structured way what are the kinds of things that help uh, because there are lots of ideas, lots of suggestions about what kinds of medications or treatments might help people with COVID. But if we don't study them in a structured way, then we don't have that opportunity to gain that knowledge. So with those 200, it is too early to say specifically uh, what, you know, if there are particular interventions that they did that may or may not have worked. Uh, but again, what I would say is that um, this is mostly those who had mild illness, who were at home throughout the duration of their illness and have now recovered. All right, we'll take one more. Uh, operator, can you put through the last caller? Yes, the last caller is Alicia Covella from Post Media. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. I have two related questions for Premier Kenny. Um, Premier, two days ago, new fee schedules for physicians were rolled out by your government. Uh, doctors who work in hospitals and are literally on the front lines of this deadly pandemic, putting their own lives at risk, are facing 20% cuts to their income. And it seems that this is very bad timing for the government to be rolling out complicated new fee schedules. And... Um, how can so how can you justify rolling out these kinds of complicated changes at the height of a pandemic? And then similarly, a medical clinic in Sundry has said that changes you've made to health doctors who work in hospitals um, and also changes to the medical liability reimbursement, they say that they can no longer afford to work in the emergency ward or perform obstetrical services. Um, are you reconsidering some of these policies that are already reducing medical access for rural Albertans and all Albertans? I completely reject the premise of your question, Alicia. Uh, there is no policy of the government that's reducing access. Uh, we are maintaining uh, as the baseline in this uh, year uh, the highest ever level of compensation for physicians in Alberta history and in the entire Federation of Canada at $5.4 billion. Uh, that was before the surge in half a billion a, a dollars of additional funds uh, as our, a part of our initial response to the pandemic. Uh, so we'll be spending more than we ever have this year on physician compensation. Uh, there is not a 20% reduction in the billable rates. To the contrary, uh, the government um, brought back uh, a uh, put in place a billing code uh, for uh, telephone consults with uh, general with GPS with uh, primary care physicians uh, when the Alberta Medical Association said it wasn't enough we basically doubled the rates so that they can bill at the same rate they get uh, uh, for people walking actually into a clinic that's that was an important measure so they actually have uh, more generous uh, uh, compensation uh, for telephone consultations than was the case in the past. Um, I, there were uh, concerns about an effort to uh, um, bring in more a more normal approach to what are called complex modifiers. The government uh, suspended those changes indefinitely, uh, precisely because of the pandemic situation. I think the primary c uh, complaint now from some of those uh, physicians is about uh, the government um, saying that we will no longer pay a facility fee when physicians are using a, a government hospital. Um, I would remind you, Alicia, that according to uh, both the uh, Dr. McKinnon's report and the Ernst & Young report on Alberta Health Services, that um, Alberta physicians receive, on average, uh, $100,000 more in compensation than their Ontario counterparts and about 25% more than in many other provinces across the country. So we we have the best compensated physicians uh, in the country. Uh, we are increasing the overall budget for physician compensation. I've, as I've always said, uh, our, uh, we uh, support, uh, admire and respect our physicians and the critical work that they do. They, that's why they deserve to be uh, compensated, not just fairly, 
uh, but generously. And uh, uh, of course, we would expect that, that physicians will continue to uh, uh, care for Albertans at this time more, more than ever. Uh, and uh, let me just say that uh, the, the Alberta Health Services uh, will always ensure that support is there, that uh, care continues to be provided, uh, for example, at the, at the Sundry Hospital in particular. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.